a reading from Romans. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. The word of the Lord. Christmas 1996 was the very last Christmas that Nancy and I spent with my extended family. Uh, my parents, my brother, his wife, and their children, and three of our four children celebrated the holiday with Nancy and me in our home in Missouri. During those days spent together, Dad announced that he wanted someone to take a photograph of him and his boys. So Dad, my brother Dale, and I posed in front of our fireplace, and Nancy took our picture. Two years later, while on furlough from Guam, I visited my parents in Minnesota. Mom, Dad, and I spent a weekend away with my brother, his wife, and their family. And during those two days together, Dad announced that he wanted someone to take a photograph of him and his boys. And so Dad, Dale, and I sat together on the couch and posed for yet another picture. While on vacation then in 2000, two years later, Again, while on furlough from Guam, I spent Memorial Day weekend with my parents on the family farm. My brother and his family were guests for the weekend as well. And I'm sure you can figure out already what happened. Dad announced yet once again he wanted someone to take a photograph of him and his boys. The three of us stood together and we posed. And then my brother's three sons ran in quick to join in the photograph. That was okay with Dad. Dad, Dad was a good guy. But after that fo photograph, Dad told his three grandsons, my nephews, to leave because he wanted someone to take a photo of him and his boys. So Dale and Dad and I posed in front of the family, in front of the patio for yet another photograph. And someday I'll have to put all of the photographs together to show you. In his own unique way, Dad's actions spoke of his pride in and his love for his two sons. And what a beautiful illustration this becomes for us of the love of God for humankind. In the second reading for today, we heard... For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We are children of God, Paul wrote. Now think about that statement for a moment. God, the Father Almighty, the cre make creator or maker of heaven and earth, calls you and me God's children. The Father Almighty has declared us to be heavenly daughters. The creator from whose fingertips all of creation came into being calls us divine sons. We are children of God, Paul wrote. 
Those words don't ring quite right for me. Personally, I think it would have been far more appropriate for Paul to have written something like, the creator of all that exists reminds women and men that they are creatures. Or the divine one would remind you and me that we are human and have limitations. Or that the perfect and sinless one would one more time tell humankind that they were sinners, poor, miserable sinners. Or at least find some words that talk about the Holy One, the one who absolutely abhors and hates sin, and then would speak some word here about sin and judgment and hell. Thank God that God does not think like your pastor. God graciously and God lovingly calls you and me children of God. God's daughters, God's sons, members of the divine family. And so in in my better moments, but still in my limited human understanding, when, when I hear God speaking affectionately and lovingly for you and for me, and really in the back of my head I hear my dad as he referred to my brother and me as being his boys. If we are truly children of God, if if we are God's delightful daughters and God's superb sons, then God does become, using the words of the text, Abba, Father. Now, Abba is an Aramaic word, which is translated as Father. It's better translated, though, as Papa or Daddy. The word is expressive of an especially close relationship to God. And so it takes a real trick of of thinking to think that, that God the Father Almighty is really my Papa. Or that the maker of heaven and earth and all that exists is my Daddy. Not just great architect of the universe, even though God is that. Not just El Shaddai. This is from Genesis 17. It probably translates best as God the mountain one. And that's the phrase from which we get God Almighty. And we know God is that, but God is more than that. And God is not just the one of whom, or to whom the angels sing, holy, 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 as we heard in the first reading, even though God always is that. Rather, God is Abba, Father, Papa, the one who loves children without measure. God is my Daddy, the one who welcomes each one of us a child of God, to sit on God's lap, as it were, who encourages all of us to come with him with all of our cares and all of our burdens and all of our worries and with whatever frightens us. He is the one who wants to hold your and my tear-stained faces and to kiss those tears away. And he is the one who desires with an indescribable love to spend eternity with us in heaven. We are children of God, Paul wrote. Paul also wrote that God is Abba, Father, God is Daddy, God is Papa, and that is the first point of this text. But the other point of the text is just as important. As children of God, now we are also heirs of God. Again from the text. 
and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him, so that we also may be glorified with him. So what does it mean to be an heir? My office dictionary gives this very precise definition of the word. A person who will become or who has become the owner of all or part of another's property or titles on that other's death. In other words, an heir is an individual who receives money or property when someone else dies. Both my parents have or had a written last will and testament for as long as I can ever remember. I had no idea of the particulars in their wills. It wasn't until the reading of my dad's will in 2010 that I first knew anything specific. One item, though, my parents shared with me years and years ago. All eight grandchildren were included in both dad's and mom's wills, each one listed by name. And you think, no big deal. For our family, it was a big deal. Of the eight grandkids, one came into the family by adoption, two by marriage, and only five by blood. So lest an unscrupulous lawyer in the state of Minnesota or some disgruntled Weinkoff family member dispute mom and dad's wills and their understanding of the term grandchild, my parents chose to list each of the eight by name. And by being specifically named, they became heirs. And God acts in the same fashion. The Heavenly Father has called you and me specifically by name. We read in Isaiah 43, but now, thus says the Lord, he who formed you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. Now, in his small catechism, Dr. Martin Luther taught us that baptism works forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this, as the words and promises of God declare. Baptism forgives, bas baptism rescues, baptism saves, but also baptism is the way that God welcomes individuals into the family of God. As the water is poured over, over a person's head and as the pastor says, name, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In that instant when water and word come together, that person is transformed into being a child of God and an heir of God. In baptism, you are transformed into being a child of God and an heir of God. We read this in Titus chapter 3. God saved us, not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the water of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit. That, my dear friends, is, is baptism language. This spirit he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. It is our baptism that makes us a child of God and then an heir of God. So let's go back to my parents' wills. Mom and dad informed me that in both of their wills, all eight grandchildren were mentioned by name. 
However, no other details were ever shared. Now, as, as a brash and unthinking teenager years ago, I suppose I could have asked about those other details. What, what about the farm? What about the house? What about the furnishings? What about the cars? What about the investments? What about the cash? And on and on. But for me to have asked those questions would have been inconsiderate and insensitive and rude and thoughtless. Mom and dad, in their wisdom, and for whatever reason they chose not to tell me, did choose never to share the details of their wills. Once again, doesn't God act in the very same fashion? Hasn't our Heavenly Father revealed to you and me only a few hints of his ultimate plan for you and me? So we read in the book of 1 Corinthians, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is imperishable, what is raised is imperishable. What it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a physical body, it is raised a spiritual body. So God's word clearly states that your body and my body in the next life will be imperishable, glorious, powerful, and spiritual. And so in good Lutheran fashion, the best we can ask is, and what does this mean? We want to know all the details as to what this imperishable, glorious, powerful, spiritual body will be like. And God doesn't give us a clue. Or we want to know what heaven will be like. And so we read in Revelation chapter 21, and in the spirit, one of the seven angels carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. It has the glory of God and a radiance like a very rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It has a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the 12 gates, 12 angels, and on the gates are inscribed the names of the 12 tribes of the Israelites. And the 12 gates are 12 pearls, each of the gates a single pearl. And the street of the city is pure gold, transparent as glass. And the writer of Revelation describes a beautiful heaven. And yet, again as Lutherans, we ask, what does this mean? What do these symbols stand for? However, we have even greater, far weightier questions regarding heaven. Will my pet kitty be there? And will there be KU men's basketball? And God doesn't answer those questions either. Baptism makes us a child of God and therefore an heir of God. However, as heirs, we do not know all the details of our inheritance. And we won't know until we live in the next life. So as we celebrate the Holy Trinity, the first Sunday after Pentecost, we are reminded of what a fantastic God we have. This Heavenly Father, this creator of all that exists, desires that we address God as Abba, Father, Papa, Daddy. And all this because God has declared that you and I are God's children. We are God's sons and daughters. We are members of God's family. And as a result of this baptism, God then makes us heirs, heirs of eternal life, a life that will be spent forever in the presence of the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. Amen.